True Crime Fix is a podcast with adult themes and graphic descriptions of crime which may not be considered suitable for all ages. Please use your discretion when listening. All research has been conducted using material in the public domain and some opinions may not be that of the author or the host. Please remember that all victims are someone's loved one and all episodes are recorded in the utmost respect of their memory. Ladies and gentlemen, you're listening to the True Crime Fix podcast with Stevie B. This case is one that most people would have heard of purely for the term bystander behaviour. But how much of the story behind the crime are people aware of? The reoccurring theme throughout most cases that I've covered, how the selfish act of one man took away someone who meant so much to so many people. But this is a story about how things could have been so much different. There is also the question of did the way of life of the victim mean that the police did not react in the right way? If you are listening to this on the release day, the 15th of March 2019, we are two days removed from the 55-year anniversary of this crime. Ladies and gentlemen, this is your true crime fix. I am your host Steve, and this episode has been written in memory of Catherine Genovese. She was born Catherine Susan Genovese on the 7th of July 1935 in Brooklyn, New York to parents Rachel and Vincent Genovese. She was raised at 29 St. John's Place, which is in Park Slope, a neighbourhood in northwest Brooklyn. In the Park Slope neighbourhood, as of the 2000 census, there was just over 65,000 people living there. But back in the 1930s, it was populated mainly by wealthy middle-class families. The area of Park Slope contains a number of historical buildings. Buildings such as the Brooklyn Academy of Music, the Brooklyn Botanical Gardens, Brooklyn Museum, and the Conservatory of Music. Today, it is considered one of New York City's most desirable neighbourhoods. Catherine was one of five children who were all of Italian-American descent. During her teenage years, Catherine, who was now going by the name Kitty, attended the all-girls school Prospect Heights High School, where she was described as being self-assured beyond her years and having a sunny disposition. However, in 1954, when Kitty was 18, her mother witnessed a murder and as a result her family moved to New Canaan in Connecticut. Kitty, who had recently graduated from high school, decided to stay in Brooklyn with her grandparents as she was engaged to marry a man by the name of Rocco in 1954. The marriage lasted no time at all, however, and was annulled by the end of the same year. Kitty eventually moved into her own apartment and had started doing clerical work for an insurance firm. To make ends meet, she was also working nights at a bar in Queens called Ev's 11th Hour Sports Bar which was on the corner of Jamaica Avenue and 193rd Street as a bartender. But when she lost her job at the insurance firm, when an undercover police officer had succeeded in persuading her to place a $9 horse racing bet on his behalf, which happened to be illegal in New York, she was taken on as a full-time bar manager. As a result of that incident, both she and her girlfriend, Dee Guarneri, were each fined $50. 
This is where the most commonly used photograph of Kitty originated. The one that not even her brother, in a 2015 documentary, realised was her mugshot. As you have probably gathered by my previous comment, Kitty Genovese was a lesbian, and with this story being set when it was, this was actually an issue for her, and I will reveal why later. In the 1960s, as it was in 48 other states, homosexuality was illegal. In 1961, Illinois became the first state to abolish the anti-sodomy laws, which effectively decriminalised homosexuality, although publicly it was still frowned upon. Also, in 1961, a local television station in California aired the first documentary about homosexuality called The Rejected. Despite the issues that the lesbian, gay and bisexual community faced, there was still a strong sense of community in New York City, especially around Greenwich Village. On the 13th of March 1963, Kitty was attending the Swing Rendezvous Bar, which, despite the legal issues, was a well-known lesbian bar. It was there that she first set eyes on the 24-year-old aspiring artist, Mary Ann Zalonko. The Swing Rendezvous was an underground club at 117 McDougall, and it had a long wooden bar which was scratched with more initials than the school desks in Greece. In an interview later in life, Mary Ann recalled she was making her way through the crowd when a cute brunette appeared at her elbow, someone whom she'd never met before. Wearing a loose blouse, slacks and having messy hair, Kitty asked, Don't I know you from somewhere? They danced together, but at the end of the night, they hadn't even exchanged names. Mary Ann recalled that Kitty had said, I'd like to see you again. Mary Ann said that she did not have a phone, but mentioned her apartment block as they parted. Mary Ann wondered if she would ever see the mysterious beauty ever again. But Kitty was smitten and savvy, managing to track down Mary Ann's flat and pin a note to her door, telling her to wait at a certain payphone downstairs at a specific time for her to call. Their next meeting was on St. Patrick's Day, at another underground bar by the name of Seven Steps. It was a bar where a member of the bar staff, who went by the name of Mitch, was actually murdered a few months later. Mary Ann and Kitty spent the evening getting to know one another, eventually going home with each other. Mary Ann recalls their differences. Kitty was an Italian-American. She was Polish-American. Kitty was Catholic. Mary Ann was agnostic. Kitty was charismatic, whilst Mary Ann was very much an introvert. It was proof that opposites attract. Mary Ann said, Kitty was the most wonderful person I have ever met. I still remember her face. I can see it in my mind. She was very Italian looking, with very chiselled features. She had dark hair and was about five feet tall. Soon into their relationship, they moved into an apartment at 8270 Austin Street in the middle class neighbourhood of Kew Gardens in Queens. Mary Ann stated, Being a gay woman in society was very hard, so we were in the closet a lot. In fact, Kitty's family didn't know there was denial there. It was very hard for them. Mary Ann expressed that Kitty sometimes felt conflicted with her sexuality and they would argue about it. In 1963, they spent their first Christmas together at the Genovese family home in Connecticut. As gifts, they exchanged wallets, one black and one brown, but otherwise they were identical. They were ready to spend their one-year anniversary together 
on the 13th of March 1964. But unfortunately, as you know, this podcast does not end with people's happiness. At 2.30 on the morning of March the 13th, 1964, Kitty Genovese left her work at Ev's 11th hour sports bar. She got into her car, a red Fiat, to drive the four and a half mile journey home. Unbeknownst to her, she was being followed. She parked up her car at Kew Garden Station car park and made her way towards the entrance to her building. She noticed that a man had parked up at the other end of the car park. She quickened her step, but the man caught up with her and plunged a knife deep into her body. Kitty let out a scream of help, but although her voice reverberated around the courtyard of the building and there were lights on in some of the flats, no one came to her aid. The man attacked Kitty again and again, until eventually there was a shout from one of the overlooking flats demanding that the man left Kitty alone. The shout startled the attacker and he fled in the direction of the car park. As he left, Kitty shouted, Oh my God, he stabbed me, help me, help me. With every ounce of energy she had left, Kitty barely made it to her feet and started slowly moving her way around the building towards her apartment. She finally reached the door, but as she did, the attacker returned. The man then proceeded to sexually assault her and stab her another few times before stealing her money and fleeing. It was believed that the whole attack lasted just over 30 minutes. Kitty's lifeless body was found by her neighbour, Sophia Ferrara, who screamed for someone to call the police. The New York Police Department were finally called at 3.50am and arrived shortly after. When the emergency services turned up, there were two fellow neighbours, one of them a 70-year-old woman who cradled Kitty's head as her life slowly slipped away. Kitty Genovese passed away in the ambulance on the way to the hospital. As some of you may have noticed, the murder took place one year to the day that she met the love of her life. During the subsequent autopsy, it was discovered that Kitty had suffered 14 stab wounds and that had let air into Kitty's chest, resulting in her lungs being compressed. Marianne Zolonko remembered that night in an interview years later. I remember I went bowling with a friend of ours and then I came home. I was tired that night and I went to bed at probably 11.30pm. The next thing that I remember is the police knocking on our door at 4am. The police said they were going to have to take me to the emergency room as I had to identify her. I was her flatmate after all. So I did. A standard notification of a person under a white sheet. I went outside and sat on the bench. They said they were going to take me home now. And I said, I'm not going anywhere. I'm waiting for her. The police returned Mary Ann to Austin Street, where at around 7am, Detective Mitchell Sang arrived to question her. Mary Ann was now with her neighbour, Carl Ross, who was helping her get through the night's trauma with alcohol. Detective Sang did not like the attitude of Carl Ross and found him intrusive to the questioning, and due to his drunken behaviour, Sang arrested Carl Ross for disorderly conduct. Detective Sang was aware of where Kitty's body had been found, and that it was directly in front of the stairs which led to where Carl Ross lived. Carl Ross had been intoxicated on the night of the 12th of March, continuing drinking into the early hours of the following morning. 
Mr. Ross revealed in a police interview that he heard noises outside and after some deliberation, he opened the door a crack to investigate. What he saw and the way he acted could have potentially given this story a completely different ending. According to Mr. Ross, the events went exactly as follows. He opened the door and saw Kitty getting stabbed by an unknown assailant, but, although she was on the floor, she was still alive and trying to talk. However, rather than either intervening or calling the police, he shut the door on Kitty and telephoned a friend to ask what to do. The friend, who was in Long Island, had advised him to do nothing. He made a second telephone call to a friend who was in the same complex, Mrs Archer. The neighbour told Mr Ross to come over. Frightened for what was transpiring outside of his door, Carl Ross climbed out of his window and over the roof to his neighbour's apartment. He was the one who eventually called the police when he heard Sophia Ferrara screaming for help. Carl Ross revealed later that he just didn't want to get involved. One of the suggestions as to the reason why Carl Ross did not want to get involved was that he was also a gay man. As I explained earlier about Marianne and Kitty, being gay in early 1960s New York, the whole community had a distrust for the police. With the arrest earlier in the day by Detective Sang, he was forced to appear before a judge and pay a $25 fine before he was released. He was also handed a suspended five-day prison sentence. Kew Gardens criminal court judge Bernard Dubin commented how many lives could have been saved if people did not ignore cries for help from others. Later in the day, homicide detectives John Carroll and Jerry Burns arrived and grilled Mary Ann on her relationship with Kitty. The questioning lasted six hours in total. Mary Ann called her employer to explain what had happened, saying that she would not be coming into work. Her boss told her that if she did not come in, then she was not to return again. So as it stood, Mary Ann had lost the love of her life on their one year anniversary and now she had lost her livelihood. During the six hours of questioning, things were not easy for Mary Ann. Inappropriate questions started to be asked about the couple's sex life. Whilst they questioned the neighbours in the Austin Street property, the questioning revolved around the gay lifestyle. The police believed Mary Ann to be the main suspect, despite the fact that Robert Moser, who was the man who initially opened the window and shouted out, and Carl Ross, who, as I described earlier, had opened his door to the attack, telling them that the perpetrator was a male. It appeared as though the police were focusing on the wrong things during this investigation. There was one other witness to this attack that needs a mention, and that is Joseph Fink. An assistant superintendent to the building across the street from 8270 Austin Street, he also acted as a doorman. His job basically entailed ensuring that the maintenance and the running of the building as well as the security, was up to scratch. On the night of the murder, Fink was sitting at his post and saw the attacker brutally stab Kitty with the knife and he also saw the start of the sexual assault. He sat and watched for several minutes before getting up, getting in the elevator and going to bed. The attacker had been scared off by this point and Kitty was still alive. He could have saved her life. In the interview that Mary Ann took part in in later life, 
She said, I still have a lot of anger towards people because they could have saved her life. I mean, all those steps along the way. When she was attacked twice, and then he sexually assaulted her too, when she was dying. I mean, you look out of the window, and you see this happening, and you don't help. How do you live with yourself, knowing that you did not do anything? That is the biggest lesson to be learnt from this. Really love each other. We have to on this planet. When the New York media started to report on the murder of Kitty Genovese, an article by Martin Gansberg was published in the New York Times with the headline, 38 who saw murder, didn't call the police. The report described the murder and the lack of compassion and actions of the neighbours. When questioned, neighbours had told police that they believed they thought it was a drunken argument or a domestic dispute, and they wanted to stay out of it. Although some of the facts reported in the story, such as the number of witnesses, the fact that the majority of the witnesses only heard the screams and didn't see them, and the fact that there was a description of three attacks when there was only two. Eventually, 40 years later, the Times would go on to re-examine their own story and certain aspects were retracted by the paper, but the crux of the story was still there. Why had a number of witnesses seen most of the attack but done nothing? A. M. Rosenthal, who was the editor of the New York Times, would go on to write a book called 38 Witnesses, The Kitty Genovese Story. This would lead to the phrase bystander behaviour, which would keep psychologists guessing for over a decade. I will circle back to this towards the end of the episode, but for the time being, back to the police investigation. About five days after the murder, the New York Police Department got a call about a home robbery which was taking place in Queens. When the police showed up, they found a television in the trunk of a car which was still parked in the vicinity. The suspect was Winston Mosley. He was arrested and taken to a local precinct where he confessed to the robbery. It was noted that Winston Mosley drove a white Chevrolet Corvair. Whilst interviewing Mosley, Detective John Tartaglia remembered that some of the witnesses at Austin Street had mentioned that they had seen an assailant in a white car. So a white car in New York City, needle in a haystack. But the attack was mentioned to Mosley, who said nothing. Tartaglia contacted the two detectives who were on the Kitty Genovese homicide case, Detective Mitchell Sang and Detective John Carroll. When they interviewed Mosley, they noticed that he had scabs on his hands which were consistent with defensive wounds. The two detectives pressed him about the murder and Mosley confessed and gave the detectives evidence that only the killer would know. Apparently, Mosley had left his bed at 2am and went for a drive. Mosley had spotted Kitty driving home whilst waiting at a red light. He said that he had been driving around Queens looking for a victim. He was looking to kill a woman, but did not give any indication as to the motive of the attack. Although Winston Mosley had no prior police record, Later in his interviews with detectives, he would also confess to several other rapes and the murders of two other women, Annie Mae Johnson and Barbara Kralik. Annie Mae was a 24-year-old who was a resident of the South Ozone Park neighbourhood of New York City. 
On the 29th of February 1964, she had been brutally slain in her apartment and according to the autopsy findings, she had been shot six times by a 22 calibre bullet. She had also been sexually assaulted by her attacker. As for Barbara Kralik, she was only 15 at the time of her murder on the 20th of July 1963. She had been stabbed to death in her parents' home in Springfield Gardens. The issue with this confession was that 18-year-old Alvin Mitchell had already confessed to this murder. There was confusion to the extent where Mosley would go on to testify at Mitchell's subsequent trial, leading to a hung jury. Alvin Mitchell was convicted at the second trial. So what do we know about Winston Mosley? He was born in Manhattan on the 2nd of March 1935 to parents Fanny and Alphonse Mosley. Although it was revealed to him later in life, Alphonse was not his biological father. His parents spent a lot of time separated and he grew up a bright but troubled boy. Winston Mosley was married twice, firstly to a lady by the name of Pauline in 1954, which led to a divorce, and then, in 1961, Mosley married Elizabeth Grant. He also had three children. By 1963, his mother had moved in with him, and his wife worked nights at a local hospital. With his job being a person who programmed punch cards during the day for first-generation cooperation, this allowed Mosley time to carry out his extracurricular activities. Winston Mosley was indicted on March 23, 1964, and Judge Erwin Shapiro was assigned to the case, and in turn, Shapiro assigned Sidney Sparrows as Mosley's defence lawyer. The trial commenced on June 8, 1964. Given Mosley's confession, the strategy for Sparrow at the trial was to go for the not guilty by the reason of insanity defence. At the trial, Mosley gave evidence to support his insanity plea. During his testimony, he gave some extremely graphic detail of the crime. So this is advance warning for anyone who is either eating their dinner or does not like to hear the graphic side of things to exercise caution during the next bit. According to Mosley's testimony, he left the house in the early hours of the morning of Friday the 13th of March 1964 with a hunting knife for the purpose of finding a woman and killing her. At approximately 3am, he spotted a red car which was being driven by Kitty. He decided to follow that car for almost 10 blocks. They both parked in the same parking lot and Kitty and Mosley exited their respective vehicles. When Kitty saw Mosley, she started to run, but he caught up with her and, as he stated, stabbed her twice in the back. Because someone had yelled out of the window at him, Mosley returned to his car to move it, but he saw that Kitty had managed to get up and she was not dead. Since he did not think that the person that called out would come down and help Kitty, regardless of the fact that she had screamed, he came back and looked for her in the Long Island Railroad Station. Not finding her there, Mosley looked in some nearby apartment buildings, where he eventually found her in the hallway. He testified, As soon as she saw me, she started screaming, and I stabbed her once in the neck. She only moaned after that. Mosley said, that he was aware that he had awakened the residents of the apartment building 
as he heard a door open at least twice, maybe three times, but when he looked up there was no one there. Since he didn't feel that people were coming down the stairs, he decided to rape Kitty. He said that he removed her undergarments and upon discovering that she was menstruating, took the hunting knife and stuck it into her vaginal tract. He said he would have pulled the knife straight up, but the bone had stopped him from doing that. Mosley attempted to rape her, but could not do so due to impotence. Nevertheless, the whole ordeal had given him the sexual gratification to still have an orgasm. After stealing her wallet, which contained $49, keys and some cosmetics, Winston Mosley fled the scene. Mosley also confessed to the other rapes and murders, but did not show one ounce of regret or remorse. Two psychiatrists testified for the defence, offering the opinion that Mosley could not tell the difference between right and wrong. The common theme throughout this episode has been the issues that the narrow-mindedness that 1960s New York had caused. The defence team stated during the trial that the willingness of Kitty to perform cunnilingus on a woman menstruating was a perversion on par with Mosley's necrophilia. Firstly, there was no evidence of this ever happening, and secondly, there is no relevance of that comment in association with this attack. Ultimately, though, the jury rejected his pleas of insanity and found him guilty of the first-degree murder of Kitty Genovese. On the 15th of June 1964, a separate court hearing was heard specifically for sentencing and whether the court should impose the maximum penalty of death. The method of execution in New York was the electric chair, with Eddie Mays having been the last one executed at Sing Sing Prison in 1963. The outcome of the hearing was that the state of New York sentenced Winston Mosley to death. In 1965, the state of New York revoked the death penalty for all crimes apart from the murder of a police officer. As a result of this, the state's Court of Appeal in 1967 commuted Mosley's sentence of execution to life in prison. Mosley would serve his sentence at Attica Correctional Facility in New York State. In early 1968, Mosley concocted a plan to escape. He proceeded to insert a tin of spam into his rectum, hoping that these injuries would force him to be moved from his cell to hospital where the security would be more lapsed. En route, he escaped from the transport van and broke into an unoccupied house. After three days of watching television and eating canned food, which he had found in the property, he called a local cleaning company and asked them to send a maid. When she arrived, he threatened her with a gun he had found in the house. He proceeded to rape her several times before warning her if she told anybody he would find her children and kill them. He then let her go. The woman did not call the police, but she did manage to get the contact details of the homeowners to warn them that someone was there. The homeowners, who were a married couple, called the police, but when they did, the police rejected their request for help, saying there was a staff changeover during 90 minutes and that they should call again later. Nervous about their property and the gun that they knew was in the house, they decided not to wait. 
When the couple arrived back at their home, they were confronted by an armed Mosley. Mosley proceeded to tie up the husband and then raped the wife. Mosley fled the house in the couple's car. It was not until Mosley broke into another property and took more hostages that he was reapprehended after a standoff with the FBI in Buffalo, where he was then returned to jail. He received two 15-year terms to run concurrently with his life sentence. In 1971, he joined the Attica Prison Uprising for better living conditions for prisons. He earned a college degree in 1977. He also applied and was rejected for parole on 18 different occasions, the last time being in 2015. On the 28th of March 2016, at the age of 81, Winston Mosley died in the maximum security prison Clinton Correctional Facility in Danamora near the Canadian border. In prison for 51 years and 8 months, he was one of the state's longest serving inmates. After her murder, the family laid Catherine Susan Genovese to rest in Lakeview Cemetery in Fairfield County, Connecticut. Normally when carrying out these episodes, this is where I would briefly eulogise about how the victim's passing has been in vain. But I cannot do this with this case. The death of Kitty Genovese has been credited for the formation of 911 in the United States in 1968. Prior to this, there was only one way to reach the emergency services, and that was by pressing zero to reach the operator and hope that they were not too busy to connect your call. After the murder, New York City officials joined together with the other states to obtain a national emergency number. The first call to the emergency number was made in Alabama on the 16th of February 1968 by Senator Rankin Fight. The second thing to develop from this case was a number of psychological studies into bystander behaviour. In 1968, Bib Latani and John Darley made their careers studying bystander behaviour, specifically bystander apathy and diffusion of responsibility. In other words, the way that people reacted to public attacks or a person feeling ill on the street when there was a large number of other witnesses. Many of their studies were conducted in laboratories, but in 1969, Jane Palavin, Irvin Palavin and Judith Rodin conducted an experiment on the New York subway. Staged emergencies were conducted in a short seven and a half minute journey between two stations. On each of the 103 trials, four researchers, two male and two female, entered the train. The two males, one would play the victim, one would play the model, which was the potential helper if no one else reacted. There were four different groups of researchers and four victims, three of which were white and one was black, all aged between 26 and 35 and all dressed casually. In 38 trials, the victim smelt of alcohol and carried a bottle in a bag. In the other 65 trials, they were sober and carried a cane. All the, in air quotes, victims took part in both scenarios. The models were aged between 24 and 29. After passing the first station, Approximately 70 seconds into the journey, the victim collapsed. In 62 of the 65 trials, in the cane situation, the
The victim was assisted prior to when the helper was due to intervene. But, in the drunk condition, the victim received help 19 out of 38 of the trials. The study suggested that more help was given to victims than earlier on studies had suggested. As for Kitty, however, the thought that someone could have reacted quicker and saved her life means that this case will be talked about for years to come. So that's it for this week. Please remember, if you enjoy the show or want to know more, please follow us on Twitter at True Crime Fix Pod. That's at True Crime Fix Pod on Twitter. Or look out for our Facebook page, True Crime Fix Podcast. That's True Crime Fix Podcast on Facebook. I'll be posting the information about the week's case on there. Also, if you have any suggestions or feedback for the show, please contact me at True Crime Fix Podcast at gmail.com. That's True Crime Fix Podcast at gmail.com. You may have noticed that the audio for this episode has slightly been improved. That's because I've finally got into the 21st century and got myself a half-decent mic. I've decided that this was a hobby and I could deal with the first few episodes with having a basic mic, but I've had my arm twisted and actually got myself a professional microphone now, so I'm hoping that the audio sounds a lot better for you guys. Until next time, stay safe, look after each other, and live life to the fullest because you never know who or what might be coming around the next corner. Take care, everyone. <laughs>